I'd like to take a few minutes and go to a prophet that actually comes from Judah. Uh, this is the prophet Micah. And he comes from a place called Moreshet Gath. Gath, or Gat, means to press. Moresha is a place in southern Judah. Um, many of the groups that I take to Israel go there. I, I really enjoy the area. He prophesied between about 750 and 685, somewhere in that ra range, 750 and 685. He, he uh, prophesied during the um, period of Yotam or Jotham, Ahaz or Ahaz, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. Uh, these are the kings of Judah. And you'll know that because in verse 1 of the book, it tells you that. We also know that he was a contemporary, and this is important. Put on the empty, uh, the opening, the empty, the opening part of Micah. He's contemporary of Isaiah. You can see that in Isaiah 1. And Hosea, in Hosea 1. He predicted the fall of Samaria before the fall of Samaria happened, and he does that in verse 6 of chapter 1. And that took place, of course, the final fall took place in 722-21. And there's a, there's a very simple style, but you may or may not be familiar with the idea of an oracle. An oracle is, um, in this case, in this context, it's a message. And there are four oracles of judgment that Micah gives, and each of those ends with something that I find to be a very sweet and intimate picture of the answer to a problem. So I'm going to put four boxes with four ends on them. A box with a line to a circle. A box with a line to a circle. Four times. The box will represent the oracle of judgment. That is the problem. The circle will represent the answer. And the entire book is structured this way. So, for our purposes, probably the smart way to do it is to simply look at 1 1 to 2 11 here, and then 2 12, and I think it's 13. Let me just check that. I think that's it. 3 1 to 12. And 4, 1 to 8. 4, 9 to 5, 1. 5, 2 through 5A, through the beginning of 5. To 7, 13. Bless you. 714 to 20. All right. That's the mechanics of it. Let me see if I can lay this out for you. There are four rounds of judgments, and each one of those rounds of judgments will be above the dotted line. Below it will be a picture. So this will be the judgment, and this will, um, you know what, I should do, shouldn't do it this way. I should do it this way. There are four intimate pictures of Messiah promised in the book of Micah. Now, you, talked, uh, you took some time to look at Isaiah, and when you did, you saw that there were some beautiful pictures of Messiah in Isaiah. Contemporary to that is another guy, this one from Judah, from southwest Judah, and he's bringing up some oracles of judgment, but they're not all identical to one another. I'd like you to take a look at Micah chapter 1, the first round of judgment, judgment round one, is this. I would call box number one, the need to judge. The need to judge. This is an introduction to the judgment. And in the first seven verses, there will be a, um, charges of rebellion and idolatry, what God gets upset about. And, and I think we need to understand what God is doing because in the mind of people, God doesn't have the right to judge them. And what happens is they walk around with a chip 
about God bringing judgment when God has already established for Israel in particular, this would be my reason for judgment, okay? So reading verses 1 through 7, somebody nice and loud. Okay, what are the basic charges that God lays as he lays out Samaria and Jerusalem, northern and southern kingdom? Look at verse 1. It gives you not only Micah, who he is and where he came from. It gives you the time that he was prophesying, Yotam Ahaz Hezkiahu, the kings of Judah. And it tells you who he's prophesying to. So I would mark alongside of the text who he is, where he comes from, when he lives, and who he's, who he's prophesying. So verse 1 gives you a lot of information. Verse 2 then begins the actual oracle of the Lord. This is the Lord's pronouncement. And he says, I need everyone to hear, all of the earth, everyone, let it be a witness against you, so that the world is employed in the judgment by God against them. God is able to move. Assyrians, Gentiles, non-believers, and employ them in the business of spanking believers if he wants to, or spanking his people, let's put it that way, in this case. And that it's not happening from some divorced position from where they are. The Lord, from his holy temple, is loving judgment against the people. That is, it is God's prerogative, and it's religious and at the heart of faith to understand that when God is disciplining people, he's doing it out of a moral justice situation from his high place of heaven. Then it says this in verse 3. The Lord is coming. He's going to come from his place. He's going to tread on the high places of the earth. What are the high places? These are worship places where people are seeking answers, not necessarily the Lord God. God is going to show up in religion. He's going to show up and look face to face in the people that have tried to sculpt a way to make a way through the world. He's going to look at them and he's going to say, the mountains will melt under him. The valleys will split. In other words, nothing will stand in his path. When he decides to level judgment, there is no place to hide. There's nothing, no physical characteristic that you can take that will sometime help you. And then it will say this. All this, verse 5, is for the rebellion of Jacob. So it comes down to what we talked about in 2 Kings, simplicity. I told you what to do. You simply said, I won't do it. Your mutiny is your rebellion. And then he says, uh, wait a minute. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Where did the Jewish people rebel? Well, wait a minute. Isn't Samaria a rebellion point? Why is Samaria a rebellion point? Because it was pl planted there by what dynasty? Who built Samaria? Omri and Ahab, the house of Omri, the Omri dynasty built up Samaria. So is that not, is, are they not synonymous with mutiny? And then he says, what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? You haven't learned the Judean kings yet, but you're going to see that they do quite a bit of their own sassiness toward God. I will make Samaria a heap of ruins. I'm going to tear down this countryside that was built into this beautiful city and I'm going to turn it back into a countryside and I'm going to have it turn into planting places for a vineyard I'll pour out her stones into the valley I'll lay bare her foundation I'm going to rip your city apart you are a symbol of prosperity and a symbol of accomplishment but you're a symbol of mutiny so I'm going to tear it down then verse 7 says 
And at my heart, I'm going to go after the idols. I'm going to smash the things that have been brought to those temples. All of her earnings is people bringing dedicatory uh, gifts to the temple. That's her earnings. He's talking about the earnings of the asherim of the temple. All of her images I will make desolate, for she collected them from a harlot's earnings. Remember, God uses the terminology of a relationship with Israel as a marriage in Hosea. When they um, give themselves to another god, he calls it adultery, and idolatry is harlotry. Harlotry is the ex expectation of the sense of a relationship without the relationship. It's essentially buying the sex. And here, here what they have is harlotry is you are acting like that's your, your spouse. It's not your spouse. Because of this, I will lament and wail. I, will, I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament like jackals and mourning like the ostriches. What you see him doing is he's walking around and he says, because of what you've done, I am going to go out and I'm going to look very strange. It's going to be counterintuitive that I have a message from God. But here's what I want you to see in verse 9. Her wound is incurable. It's come to Judah. It's reached the gates of my people, even Jerusalem. There is not a solution for what you're doing in simple repentance because you've now so deeply embedded your ungodliness and mutiny, I'm going to have to act. This isn't saying you can't change or repent. It's saying, you know, those kids are so wound up now, they cannot settle down. I'm going to have to walk in and spank. That's going to have to happen. There's no choice now. There's no turning back. Tell it not in Gat. Weep not at all. At Beit Afra, this is the house, uh, to the house of the dust. Roll yourself in the dust. In the house of the dust, roll yourself in the dust. Go on your way, an inhabitant uh, of Shafir in nakedness. The word Shafir is, is the word for, it's a type of beauty. And it's a place in Philistia, it's down in the, uh, near Judah, and in shameful nakedness. The inhabitants of Za'anan does not escape. The lamentation of, of Beit Etzel, he will take from you its support. Beit Etzel is a place in Judah, and it, it, um, it comes from, the word Beit, of course, is house of. Um, it's a, it's a com, uh, combination word, but for our purposes, it's important for you to know that it probably has something to do with a support or a beam. And he says, he will take away from you its support. For the inhabitant of Marot becomes weak, waiting for good because of a calamity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lachish. Lachish is a major city of Judah, one of the largest cities. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion because in you were found re the rebellious acts of Israel. Lachish is a city I visit often in Israel. The remains of it are there. In fact, a large cache of, uh, of uh, dead bodies was found there. And it's a tragic city of the, of the fall of Judah and the um, uh, execution of a lot of people. The important thing is that he reveals that some of the rebellion started there. Don't get lost in the details. Just keep walking. Therefore, you will give parting gifts on behalf of Mereshet Gat. The houses of Achziv will become a deception. These are places. Okay, I can take you to the places, but for right now, just know that they're places to the kings of Israel. Moreover, I will bring on you the one who takes possession, O inhabitant of Mereshet. The glory of Israel will enter Adullam. And remember the cave of Adullam where uh, David was hiding? So that, again, is a place. Make yourself bald. Cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like the eagle, for they will go from you into exile. What is he talking about with baldness? Shave, shave your head. Why? When do you shave your head normally? There's only two normal places. Vows or mourning. This is mourning. In other words, it's a done deal. Shave your head as though they already died, because they're going to. They're going to be carted off this nation is coming to its end. It's going to be carted off. And then he turns his attempt to explain some of the reasons why God is doing this. Woe to those who scheme iniquity. 
who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields, and then they seize them, and houses, and take them away. Here's their problem. Greed, scheming, theft. Greed, scheming, theft. They lie in bed, and through scheming, they take that greedy heart of theirs, and they go out and they rob people and steal away from them righteousness. They rob a man in his house, therefore, uh, and, and a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am planning against this family a calamity. You've been lying in bed planning how you're going to sin. I've been lying in bed planning how I'm going to bring you down when you do. You think that you're the only one who knows how to make trouble happen? I can make trouble happen too. And he says, for which you cannot remove your necks. I am going to bring about something that's going to put you in a clamp that your neck can't get out of. And you will not walk haughtily. Your pride will be taken from you. It will be an evil time. On that day, they will take up against you a taunt and utter a bitter lamentation and say, we are completely destroyed. He exchanges the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to the apostate. He apportions our fields. Therefore, you will have no one stretching a measuring line for you by the lot in the assembly of the Lord. I'm going to take away your surveyors. Nobody's going to be able to buy or sell your land because I'm giving it to somebody else. I'm going to take all of it from you. Everything you've worked for is gone. It's going to be gone. If you're feeling bad right now, you're supposed to. That's what he's doing. In verse 6, there was a quiet compromise of truth. Look at it. Quiet compromise of truth. Do not speak out. So they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not be turned back. He says, there's many who are called to say, this is wrong, but they won't say it. They'll compromise their way into not saying it. And the nation will slide right into something because even the experts who know what's going wrong won't tell you. Verse 7. Is it being said of the house of Jacob? Is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to the one walking uprightly? Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You stripped the, robe, off the, uh, the uh, uh, robe of the garment from the unsuspecting passers-by, from those returned from war. The women of my people you evict, each one from, his, uh, from her pleasant house. From her children, you take my splendor forever. Arise and go, for there is no place of rest because of the uncleanness that brings on destruction, a painful destruction. Now, what is he saying to them? He's saying you're taking people who are coming back from being beat down in the world and you're stealing what's left. You're taking weak widows and stealing their property. In other words, there's unbridled greed and theft going on in the country. You keep stealing the land from each other, so I'm going to take it from all of you. None of you are getting it. And then he goes on, and he says in verse 11, if a man walking after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I will speak out to you concerning wine and liquor, he would be a spokesman to this people. He says, if a guy gets up and he's going to tell lies, and he's going to tell you stuff that you want to hear. This people is going to turn him into a spokesman even when they know he's not telling the truth. You can't imagine a situation where people will allow people that they have been shown repeatedly to be liars and elect them to the high offices, can you? Of course you can. He says that's what Judah is doing. Now, at this point, you should not be encouraged. At this point, you should be discouraged. You should go, wow. These guys have really done a lot wrong. But the answer comes in the small balloon that's at the bottom of the box. So I want you to note, if I wanted a picture of Jesus, if I wanted a picture of the coming Messiah, I could look straight across here with my eye and look right to these passages, and here's what I would find. I would find that if the problem is in the box, the answer is in the balloon. What is Messiah's picture? There's a Messiah coming. And, and this is what he says in verses 12 and 13. But it's hard to understand. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. Circle the all. What is all of Jacob? What does that mean? 
Israel and Judah. Make a note that Hosea, uh, I'm sorry, that Micah chapter 2 verse 12 is one of half a dozen places you're going to see Messiah is going to be personally responsible for regathering lost tribes of Israel and known tribes of Judah, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. That is, those who come from what's left of Israel after it goes through all that it does. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. Now, stop there for a minute and look at the image. When you bring sheep into the fold, what are you doing? You're bringing them into safety, and the sheep will lie down when they know that they're protected. It's not, it, it requires a very strong shepherd to project enough sternness to secure sheep to make them lie down in green pastures like Psalm 23. Most of the time, sheep stand. But they will lie down in a sheepfold if they're brought in and tended. So he says, I'm going to gather up what's left of Israel and Judah. And I'm going to bring them into a sheepfold and I'm going to give them a place of rest. And then he says, the breaker goes up before them and they break out, pass through the gate and go out by it. So their king goes on before them and the, ki and the, and the Lord at their head. Notice a couple things. Go to the end of the sentence because it's easier. And just notice that the one who is coming who will gather Israel and Judah is a king. But he's also the Lord. He's both a physical king and the God of Israel. Both. This is part of the messianic promise. When you want to say, who is Jesus? Who is this Messiah? Well, he's king of Israel, but he's also the Lord of the universe and Lord of the people. He's the master of the people. He's the king of the people. He has a physical side to his rule and a spiritual side to his rule. It's the first half of the sentence you should be struggling with. So I want you to go to Matthew chapter 11. Go to verse Matthew 11, 12. You will not necessarily pick this up if somebody doesn't guide you through it. But once you see it, I think you'll see it. Matthew eleven twelve 12 are the words about John the Baptist. And it's Jesus speaking. And I'm going to go 11, 11. Matthew 11, 11 first. But verse 12 is what you're looking for. In your Bible, in Micah chapter uh, 2, verse 13, you should write Matthew eleven twelve 12 next to it. Okay, Matthew eleven twelve. 12. You're going to miss something in the Gospels if you don't know what Micah had prophesied. We'll do this and then we'll get lunch, okay? Jesus said in Matthew eleven eleven, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. What is he saying? There is a kingdom coming... And John is before that kingdom. And John is the greatest that's ever been, but he's nothing compared to what will be once the kingdom begins. So he's important in where we are right now on the timeline, Jesus said. But someday what John knows will be baby stuff compared to what the people in the kingdom will know. And in a very real sense, what you know of God's program, if you understand the prophecy and understand the, the New Testament, you got a lot more understanding than John ever had. John only knew what John saw. He was surrendered and important in his surrender, but unimportant in his knowledge compared to Chaim. Now, what I want you to know is the, there's a word here that comes from, in, in Micah 2.13, the word breaker, is the word poretz. And I'm about to apply that to Matthew 11. The word poretz is the word breaker or breach maker. Okay? Now, listen to the prophecy of Jesus because it gets massacred all the time. It says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, John is himself is Elijah who has come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
it sounds like Jesus is lamenting the bad things that have happened to people who followed, uh, followed God. Like up till now, every time somebody prophesies, they cut their head off. And that's how people read it. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think if you look at the word suffers violence, actually what he's talking about is a prophecy concerning himself. The, the word forcibly entered, the word suffered violence is the Greek term forcibly entered or forcibly broke out. It's the word for a guy who's sitting in jail and somebody blows the wall and he runs out. It's the word in Hebrew, poretz. It's the word breacher or breach maker or the guy who breaks the wall. Now let me see if I can do something with this because it's a little bit of a tough concept. I believe Jesus wasn't lamenting what people did to his prophets. I believe what he was doing was making John the first of the sheep that breaches the wall. And here's what I want you to picture. Imagine for a moment that this corner back here is a cave. And over my head is a cave. And it just comes out here to about where these uh, trees come out. And I stack up rocks here around the front. And I bring the sheep into the sheepfold. And I lie down because I am the door, right? So I lay down at the sheepfold and I keep the sheep in. They see me. I put along the top some thorny poterium that act like barbed wire, natural barbed wire. This is the way it's done in the wilderness. And you put it around there and all the sheep come in. You lie down at the door and the sheep know that the foxes won't go up on the thorny poterium so that their young are all safe and they'll lie down. Everybody's, everybody's happy, okay? Now you're in for the night. In the morning... The sheep are anxious to get out to the field because the, there's nothing to eat here. It's all out there on the hillside. They can see it. They can smell it. So they're trying to get out. So what happens is you're the door, and you start to step out of the way to let them to go out, but there's only stacked stones with thorny poterium on top. In other words, if I kick that wall, it'll fall down. There's no mortar in it. I built it yesterday, okay? I threw some stones, stacked them up, put some stuff on top of it. That's all there is. What happens is the sheep get rambunctious to get out, and some of the bigger sheep will push parts of the wall down to get over parts of the wall. They're what are called porets or breach makers. They create breaches in the wall. And I think what Jesus was saying in Matthew 11 is about what Micah says. Micah said this, The breach maker will go forth in front of them and break out and pass through the gate and go by it. In other words, like the sheep coming out, they'll widen the gate, they'll push it down. The breach-making sheep will be the first one out. He'll be the pioneer. So their king goes on before them and the Lord at their head. I think what he was doing in Matthew 11 is badly translated because they weren't making reference to the Micah prophecy. I think what Jesus was saying is, Malachi said Elijah would come before Messiah. Micah said a breach maker will come. John is Elijah and he is the breach maker. I think the Poretz is who he is. In other words, Jesus is saying, therefore I am your king and your Lord. That's who I am. And if you know my prophecies, you'll know what I look like when I got here. I think Jesus is misunderstood in the passage. I think the passage gets, uh, sounds like Jesus is whining about dead prophets. I don't think he is. I think he's trying to identify who John is based on Micah and Malachi. But you have to know the prophecies to apply them. And what happens is people without a knowledge of the prophecies drop it and then try to figure out a way to make the Greek sound like something they can understand. And that's how you got this, this version of it. I don't think that's the right way to say it. Okay? By the way, in the Hebrew edition of the New Testament done in modern Hebrew, uh, the word poretz is used and the word breach maker and the whole thing becomes about Micah, not about this. So there are Messianic believers who pick that up, but there's not necessarily picked up in, and that's only true of one of the translations. It's not true of all of them. It's true of some of them. Okay, we're going to take a break, but here's what we discovered. God is justified to judge Jacob. God is justified to take away their land because they've mishandled the land. God is justified to take away their direct spiritual connection to him because they've already made gods of other nations. You want a different God? You don't appreciate the land? I'll take you from the land and give you a different God if that's what you want. Remember, that first box is this. If you want it bad enough, God will give you what you want. One of the greatest punishments God will ever give anyone is exactly what they asked for. Um, I think Bible Fellowship had on their front sign last week 
Uh, God doesn't send people to hell. He just, um, he does what they ask. Something like that. You don't want me? Okay. You don't have to have me. For eternity, I will leave you alone. And, and that's sad. Be careful what you ask for. But the, the beauty of it is this. There is right there in verses 12 and 13 of the first section of Micah, a beautiful picture that a breach maker would come, open up the kingdom, and behind it would come one who is both the king and the Lord. And that is who Messiah is.